welcome back uh, in the last class under uh, this section uh, axiomatic propositional logic we presented uh, Russell Whitehead's uh, axiomatic system uh, that is what we find it in the book Principia Mathematica um, in, in one of the sections on deductions uh, you will find some interesting proofs such as law of identity law of non-contradiction and many other important theorems so what is our uh, main goal May our main goal was this that uh, all the valid formulas in your formal axiomatic system should find a proof so that is the reason why we are doing this axiomatic propositional calculus. So today we will be presenting another axiomatic system which is due to another two set, set of uh, mathematicians uh, they are Hilbert and Ackerman Hilbert is famous for his uh, different uh, challenges and all Hilbert they are called as Hilbert problems so we will not be talking about all the problems and all but so we are presenting a kind of axiomatic system which is proposed by Hilbert and Ackerman. So what uh, Hilbert's interest was mainly axiomatizing geometry. So he lived from 1862 to 1943 his dream was indeed to create a perfect axiomatic system for mathematics or at least in, uh, if, we, if you restrict ourselves to at least geometry and arithmetic as far as geometry and arithmetic are concerned he wants to come up with a grand axiomatic system. Uh, if you can construct this axiomatic system then what will happen is this that all possible true statements can be uh, proved or you can show that uh, all the provable theorems can be uh, are automatically true. So now according to him the consistency is a part of uh, mathematics such as uh, in the case of natural numbers it was established by some kind of finitary methods which could not lead to any contradiction start with tautologies you will never end up with a contradiction then this part can be used as a secure foundations for the entire mathematics so you showed that uh, uh, by using some kind of finitary methods you could come up with uh, uh, some proofs which are uh, devoid of contradictions and that can be used as a pillar for uh, constructing uh, some other kind of theorems and all. so it is only till Gödel um, Gödel has come up with an interesting uh, theorem uh, which is called as incompleteness theorem uh, according to which uh, for any formal axiomatic system as is the case of uh, Principia Mathematica or uh, the Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system so he, is, he has come up with a radical kind of uh, view uh, that is this that there, is, there are always some statements about natural numbers that is in the arithmetic which are obviously considered to be true which cannot be proven within the system with using its own axioms and with uh, using its own principles etc so that means uh, system leads to incompleteness what is incompleteness uh, anything which is uh, provable uh, is true or if you can show it to be valid and all the valid formulas have to be have to find a proof if that is the case then your system is considered to be complete so now Gödel has come up with uh, an interesting uh, kind of uh, theorem with which one can know uh, one can show that no consistent system can be used to prove its own consistency if you think that you know Principia Mathematica and Hilbert Ackerman system uh, they are considered to be consistent in a way Hilbert's uh, dream has been shattered by this one of the important uh, theorems in logic that is Gödel's incompleteness theorem which we will talk about it. Uh, under the limitations of uh, the first order logic so as far as propositional logics are concerned they are all decidable and uh, complete and consistent and sound but whereas uh, in the case of first order logics they are semi decidable and uh, it leads to incompleteness etc so in the context of uh, first order logic when I uh, talk about predicate logic these things will become uh, uh, prominent so our goal is to present in this lecture is to present Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system and then we will be proving some uh, important theorems such as P plus P, P R not P etc and, all. and then not only that thing we will be making use of one important theorem uh, propositional logic axiomatic propositional logic so that is the deduction theorem if you can use deduction theorem with the uh, with the set of axioms that you already have then our proofs with our proofs will become simpler so now to start with the Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system 
it is presented in various ways in uh, various textbooks in particular uh, in most of the textbooks uh, uh, these are the three exams that are uh, provided in the uh, textbooks uh, like uh, Mendelssohn etc. So these are some of the axioms you have to note that Hilbert Ackerman makes use of only two primitive logical symbols that is implication and negation. So these are the only two symbols which you commonly find it in uh, you find it in the Hilbert Ackerman axioms. So to start with any axiomatic system consists of uh, a set of axioms and transformation rules and of course the rule of detachment. So instead of five axioms as is the case of uh, Bertrand and Russell and Whitehead we have only three axioms here and all these axioms are in the uh, are expressed in terms of implication and negation. The first axiom is A implies B implies A and the second one A implies B implies C implies A implies B implies A implies C and now this third axiom was stated like this in the beginning not B implies not A is A implies B but in some textbooks uh, uh, like Mendelssohn introduction to mathematical logic you will find this particular kind of thing uh, not B implies not A implies not B implies A implies B but uh, when you can show that uh, uh, if you take only the first three axioms uh, that will be that will constitute a formal axiomatic system and then if you take the first two axioms one and two and the fourth one which is there at the top of the slide then you can formulate a, a different kind of axiomatic system let us say H prime. So now we can easily show that uh, this H and H prime are uh, more or less uh, they are same uh, if you can somehow show that uh, this uh, not B implies not A or A implies B you will, you will get it as an outcome of uh, this uh, revised kind of axiom that is not B implies not A not B implies C A implies B then you can show that uh, these two axiomatic systems are similar to each other. So I will be taking into consideration the first two axioms and the revised axiom which was presented by Mendelssohn in the in the tradition of Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system. So now using these axioms what essentially we are trying to do is we are trying to prove some important theorems. So now so far we have seen some important theorems such as P implies P in Russell Whitehead axiomatic system. So now we try to show uh, with the help of uh, Silbert Ackerman axiomatic system you will be proving uh, some of the important theorems such as A implies A. So now any axiomatic system this law of identity uh, should come as an outcome. So now these are the important things that we need to know these are the axioms you can write H A 1 H stands for Hilbert Ackerman and then this is axiom number 1. A implies B implies A, H A 2, A implies B implies C, implies A implies B implies A implies C. So third one is like this not B implies not A this is what we are going to take into consideration the revised axiom this means not B implies A implies brackets needs to be closed properly and if you want you can write something and the rule of detachment is uh, as it is suppose if you can assume that A and if you can assume that A implies B from this these two things you will get B as an outcome. So we will be making use of uh, these things on the right hand side of the board in proving some of the important theorems uh, then we uh, later we will use another one which is called as deduction theorem so which we will employ it little bit later. So now we are trying to show A implies A by using only these axioms and some kind of transformation rules plus this detachment rule. So now uh, what exactly we are trying to do is we are trimming these axioms in such a way that it leads to another kind of truth these are all obviously true statements you trim it in such a way so that it transforms uh, into this particular kind of preposition. So now for this you start with the uh, Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system 2 so that is A implies B implies C uh, same thing which we are writing it again A implies B implies A implies C. So now in this what you will do is 
for wherever you find b you substitute it as a in plus e uh, and uh, wherever you find c you substitute with a and of course uh, uh, even b also as e so that means you are replacing b with a and you are replacing uh, sorry you are replacing b with a in plus a c with uh, a and this is not required at all. So these are the two operations that you are trying to do. So the rationale behind this uh, thing is is that if you substitute anything into this axiom uniformly, that will retain its tautology hood. That means it's still it will still act like a tautology. It is a tautology. So so now this is the first step, and the second step is this. A is as it is because we are proving a implies a. That means you have to eliminate this uh, b's and c's somehow so that you will find only a's in your formula so that's the reason why we use this uniform substitution rule so now what is b here b means a implies a and then c is also considered to be a now now second one a implies a implies a so b is a implies a so that is the first one and then second one is a implies a. So ultimately, we ensured that the last step of your condition, uh, last uh, the consequent of your conditional at the uh, occupying the last position is somewhat closer to what we are trying to prove. So that means a implies a. So now, what one needs to do is somehow we need to detach the whole thing, and somehow you get this particular kind of thing, which that is what we desire. So now, this is step number two. So now we have an axiom a implies b implies a so now in this you substitute again for b you substitute a implies c so now this becomes what is this this is axiom number 1 h a 1 if we can understand one proof then we can solve we can prove many other theorems now so so this will become instead of b we write a implies a and then this is as it is so this is what instance of hilbert ackermann axiomatic system 1 that means you substituted a implies a for b and this is what you get so now the fifth step you observe these two things so this is same as this one so now these two what are these things 2 and 4 you have to write justification here modus ponens that means you use this particular kind of rule then this gets detached and then whatever remains is this one a implies a implies a is this one so that is a implies a implies a this part goes and all it gets detached and whatever remains is this portion whatever is there afterwards implies a implies a. So this is how, how did we get this one by applying modus ponens on 2 and 4. So now in the sixth step still it is not in this particular kind of form somehow we need to detach this thing. So how do we detach this particular kind of thing somehow we need to again fall back on our axioms uh, if you can use any one of these two things you will not get to this particular kind of form but if you use this one you transform it in such a way that for example if instead of b. Uh, you put a here then it will become a in plus a in plus c so now a in plus a in plus a what is this this is an instance of axiom number 1 because instead of b we had put a here uniformly you substituted a for b so this is what you get so now under the 8th step so these two are same a in plus a in plus a and a in plus a in plus a this is like x and x implies y so you will get y so now in the 8th step you will get a so now what is that we are seeing in this particular kind of proof you might come up with a in plus a in maybe in less number of steps but this appears to be the case that at least 7 or 8 steps are involved in proving a in plus a so there's, there are at least two things which you need to note I start with the axioms 
and then you I trim these axioms in such a way that I will form this particular kind of theorems. So these theorems might come in four steps, sometimes seven steps, or sometimes if your axiom the choice of your axioms are wrong, then you'll be you will be playing with it and ultimately it might it might take some 16 steps sometimes proofs might take even days also. So the effective proof is considered to be that particular kind of proof which ends in finite steps in finite intervals of time that means if a proof never ends in it goes on and on and all and that is not considered to be an effective kind of proof. So you should also note that all these proofs you can transform it into some kind of language programming language and then you can talk about this particular kind of thing or you can develop a software in which you give the feedback of all these axioms and all and then you put this data in place whether it is a theorem or not that software will tell us whether this is a theorem or not or there are some softwares which provide even proofs also that is not what we are going into the details of it so as a first step we are trying to show how we can generate A in place A by producing some kind of rigorous proof. So with this proof what uh, what else we can find out is this that uh, everything is listed here that means everything is stated explicitly in terms of axioms which are considered to be obviously true and then the modus ponens rule which is a truth preserving rule and transformation rules also preserves the truth. So everywhere we are uh, everywhere the, the you consider it as hypothesis or premises they are all true and the final step of your proof is called usually called as a theorem that is what we are said in the beginning of uh, discussing this particular kind of axiomatic propositional logic. So this is the first theorem which uh, you will get it as an outcome and from this uh, uh, by definition you can say it is A R A etc. So this also can be proved and all if this is proved then not A or A can also come as a theorem. So, so now what we will be doing is uh, uh, so we will be proving some other kinds of theorems such as uh, not not B implies B. So let us get ourselves familiarized with uh, this particular kind of axiomatic system. So what essentially we are trying to do is is that so we have formulated an axiomatic system uh, then in that axiomatic system which consists of only few rules and using this only we have only few axioms and very minimal set of rules and all and with that you generate all kinds of uh, uh, true statements that are theorems. So you are not supposed to use anything outside these three axioms and all so if you use anything outside the uh, things and all like in the case of Euclidean axiomatic system that is also considered to be a formal axiomatic system but the problem there was is that the proofs are not rigorous like these proofs and all in the sense that there are many implicit assumptions which are part and parcel of your proof and there are certain things which are not part of the proof also they also took part in the proof. And all. So in that sense Euclidean axiomatic system is not so rigorous like the axiomatic system that we are trying to present the very purpose of presenting this axiomatic system is to uh, to get rid of those uh, non rigorous kind of proofs. So in this thing everything is stated explicitly there is nothing hidden no hidden assumptions are there so everything comes through by trimming these axioms you will get uh, your uh, theorems. So now let us try to prove another uh, theorem which uh, we, have, we have already proved it in the in the axiomatic system due to Russell and Whitehead. So let us see how we can prove this particular kind of theorem. So now so depending upon what axiom that you are going to choose we can start with any one of these axioms and all. So if you want to show that this is true this is a theorem then one needs to start with one of these things because these are the only things which are given to us. It seems that the third axiom if you take and take into consideration then somehow we will get into this particular kind of form not B implies A implies B. So this is axiom number 3 you need to provide justification on the right hand side or maybe here 
the left hand side and all. So, now one instance of uh, this particular kind of axiom is this one. So, now what you have done here is, is that for A you substituted not B. So, wherever you find A you substitute it with not B, A means not B. So, that is why not is already there, so that is why it becomes like this. So, now this is uh, not B and A is not B and then B is as it is. So, this is the first step that we have. Uh, 1 and 2. So, now just now, uh, uh, so there is a, um, a law of identity which we have showed it just now that is uh, B plus B is the one which we have showed just now. So, now in this if you put B for not B then this will become this. One. So, this is what law of identity you can say this which we have already proved. So, now uh, so what we will be using is uh, in order to simplify this proof. So, uh, not not B in plus B in the case of uh, Russell weighted axiomatic system it involves some some 14, uh, 14 steps and all to show that not not B in plus B is a, is a rule of double negation. So, now we will pause uh, things for a while here and then we will talk about uh, one Im important theorem in uh, the axiomatic propositional logic. So, that is the deduction theorem and then now then we will make use of this deduction theorem in proving this particular kind of thing. So, this is uh, what is considered to be the deduction theorem. So, I will come back to this particular theorem little bit later. So, now this deduction theorem is due to Herbrand in the year 1930s around the same time even natural deduction systems have also come into existence uh, we do not know exactly what kind of relation uh, you will find it between Herbrand's uh, deduction theorem and natural deduction theorem natural proofs using uh, natural deduction theorem uh, that is due to uh, Provids and uh, others Genzen etc. So, this theorem says like this of course, every theorem has to find a proof. Suppose if you if you take gamma as set of well formed formulas in a sense that it has all the well formed formulas which you can think of and you single out two formulas A B they are considered to be individual formulas and if it so happened that B is deduced from gamma and A then A plus B can be deduced from gamma. So, that is like this. So, this is what we, we discuss about it. So, now you started with uh, a particular kind of set of well formed formulas. Now, then from that uh, you also have A and from this you deduce B. So, if you can deduce B from this thing that means B has come after some kind of steps some finite number of steps you got B if that is the case then you discharge these assumptions and then you talk about this thing from gamma you can even derive A in plus B. So, that is what is the case so, this is what is called as deduction theorem so, that means from a given set of formulas uh, gamma and taking an assumption A you deduce B that means you already you already said to have deduced A in plus B from a given set of formulas gamma particularly if you have this particular kind of thing A and from that you generated B this is what you write it in this way then of course gamma is already there here then you say that it is gamma A implies B this is the same thing which we have said already. So, this is what is considered to be a deduction theorem actually in mathematics uh, every theorem has to find a proof and all at this moment we are not trying to produce proof for this particular kind of thing otherwise 
it has to every suppose if you say that it is a theorem and, and if you do not have a proof then it is not considered to be a theorem. So every theorem has to find a proof but due to the limitations of time and all we are not going into the details of uh, uh, the proof of this particular kind of theorem but we make use of the idea uh, behind this particular kind of theorem. So there are two important corollaries for uh, this particular kind of uh, theorem so they are like this. Uh, suppose if A implies B and B implies C are there already there and one of the outcome of this one is, is that you can deduce A implies C. So you have, you have deduced let us assume that uh, these are the two hypotheses and all so now let us try to prove this thing you have a set of formulas gamma and then you have A implies B and you have B implies C and from that you will get A implies C. So how do we prove this thing uh, you take A implies B as a hypothesis and B implies C as another hypothesis. Now you assume the antecedent of this uh, conclusion let us say this is the uh, conclusion A implies C. So now you take the antecedent of your uh, conclusion which appears in the form of a condition. So these are the steps that we have. So now 1 and 3 modus ponens uh, 1 and 3 modus ponens you will get B. So now in the fifth step 2 and 4 modus ponens that is this principle we have used from A if A implies B then you can deduce B. So now these two modus ponens you will get C. So now in the natural deduction proof and all uh, or you can use deduction theorem now uh, since uh, from uh, from A you got C so that means it is like this. So from uh, C, C is obtained from A with some kind of steps and all one or two steps are there involved in this thing that means you can write here in the sixth step you can write like this now in the seventh step you can simply write like this this left hand side goes to the right hand side and you will get C. So A implies C is the one which we are trying to deduce. So one of the important corollaries of this particular kind of theorem is, is that if A implies B is reduced and A implies B and B implies C is the hypothesis then from that you can deduce A implies C. So this we can make use of it and the other important corollary is this thing from A implies B implies C and you have B then you can deduce A implies C so this is in this kind of thing. So this is one of the important corollaries of deduction theorem so what is that we will write it down here A implies B implies C A implies B and then A implies C. So this is another important corollary and then I will go into the proof of this thing. So these are the two corollaries corollary 1 and then this is corollary 2. So now you have A implies B implies C and A implies C uh, sorry A implies B from that you can deduce A implies C. So now let us see how we can uh, do it. So now first thing uh, which you will find it on the slide is, is that uh, A implies B implies C is what is given to us. So now A implies B is already given so there are the two things which you find it in the hypothesis and these are the given kinds of things. So now using axiom number 2 that is A implies B implies C is A implies B implies A implies C. So that is the axiom that we will make use of it and then you apply uh, modus ponens on 1 and 3 because you have the same thing A implies B implies C then what you get is A implies B implies A implies C. So now we already have A implies B so that means you will get A implies C uh, if you want to show it uh, clearly and all so now this I think uh, we do not have space uh, here so we will not go into the details of that one so proof is already there here. So now 
uh, this is corollary 2. Now we make use of uh, these uh, theorems in proving this uh, not not b implies b. So now uh, this is in this particular kind of format. So for example if you take into consideration this as a and this as b the whole thing and this as c it is like this thing a implies b implies c a implies b implies c. So now the second statement uh, actually the, the important corollary of this one is like this suppose if you have a formula like this a implies b implies c and then b then uh, you will get a implies a implies c. So this is also one of the important corollaries of reduction theorem. So that is the theorem which we have uh, proved now just simply b from that you will get a implies c. So now in this sense now you take this a as this one the whole thing and b as this one c as b. So now we have a formula like this a implies b implies c the first formula and then b is same as this one this particular kind of portion and from that you should be able to get a implies uh, c. So that is uh, so what we should get here uh, if you apply this particular kind of thing so this uh, a implies c is the one which you need to get what is a here this is not b implies not not b implies c is b so that is what you get by using corollary 2 actually this needs to be modified in this particular kind of sense a implies b implies c and b from this you will get a implies c one can prove it by one can show it by using a set of things which we already know one of these axioms you can take into consideration and maybe more exponents etc we apply on this one you will get this a implies c for this you start with a implies b implies c as a first step and then you assume this second thing and then the third thing is you assume the antecedent of your conditional that is a. So now as a fourth step 1 and 3 1 and 3 modus ponens you will get b implies c. So now fifth step b and 2 and 4 again modus ponens that means this one b and b implies c you will get c. So now you have deduced C from A so that means you apply deduction theorem again and this will become A implies C means this is A implies C so this is the way we can prove this particular kind of theorem the corollary will come as an outcome in this way so you not have to apply any axiom here you just use modus ponens rule then ultimately you got this particular kind of thing. The same rule is employed here and this is now what we get. So now till now it is not in this particular kind of format now somehow we need to use axiom number 1 A implies B implies A. If we can substitute A for not not a for not not b and b remains as it is then for a it is not not b implies b is as it is then a is not not b. So now observe this particular kind of thing not not b implies b implies this one and the same thing not uh, one second and b as substitute b as not so then it will remain the same thing so now not not b implies this one some x and this x implies this thing 
now use corollary 1 so that is if a in plus b and b in plus c and a in plus c is the case so you have to read it in this way from 6 to 7 you need to go not not b in place this one and the same thing in place this one that means uh, this will become not not b in place b this is what we are trying to show so now uh, using uh, this deduction theorem and its important corollaries uh, we might simplify our proofs so again what is this deduction theorem again it preserves the truth so every step of your proof is a kind of truth preserving kind of uh, thing which we are employing here so that is why the final final step of your proof is also considered to be a theorem so final step of your proof is usually considered to be a theorem so that is why this is proved in this particular sense so there are some other important and interesting proofs uh, one can uh, do it this is this is only for our practice so the more and more we practice the more and more uh, efficient we will become in deriving these theorems so now let us say we are trying to prove uh, instead of not not b implies b we are trying to prove b implies not not b so this is the other way around we see not not b in plus b is a double negation but we are trying to show this one. so how do we uh, go about this thing so in, for proving this particular kind of thing you need to choose some of these axioms <laughs> so they are like this first you start with axiom number 3 what is this axiom number 3 not b implies not a uh, not b implies a B. Of course, uh, you can do the same thing by uh, using its corresponding uh, axiom and all, which is uh, there and all. So that is not B implies not A implies B plus A implies B. One can use this one also, but we are making use of revised version of uh, Hilbert uh, Ackerman system. So now you start with uh, this particular kind of uh, thing. Now you substitute uh, not not b for wherever you uh, b occurs. You substitute with uh, this thing uh, and a wherever you find a, you substitute with b. Then this will become what is b now? Not not. So not of what is a here it is b so b means not not b plus a means uh, b and now b means not not b what is this instance of uh, uh, instance of axiom 3 so this is what is considered to be an instance of uh, axiom number 3. So what is that we are trying to derive we are trying to derive b implies not not b so you might ask we might ask ourselves that so why you need to follow all these steps and all. I can jump to I take one axiom and then jump to this particular kind of thing usually you do not get it like that so it is a it is a path which leads to this particular kind of truth one truth lead is leading to another kind of truth so this is not at over somehow we trim this axiom in such a way that the last uh, in the, suppose if you take this uh, as a whole well formed formula uh, the last part of this conditional is somehow turning out to be this one it is coming closer to this one so this is the second step uh, so now just now we showed law of uh, double negation this is what we have already proved this is what is double negation so now in this one you substitute for b not b wherever b is there you substitute with not b then it will become not b and b is this one so now uh, for this is what instance of double negation so now fifth one uh, 2 and 4 modus ponens because this is same as this one these two modus ponens you will get not not b plus b 
uh, that implies uh, whatever is a not not b. So now till now we did not get uh, this uh, thing and all. Somehow we need to use some other kind of axiom, and we need to convert it into uh, appropriate form. So now we have this axiom a implies b implies a. Uh, so now here in this one suppose if you can somehow you convert this b plus a as the same thing then you can say uh, this particular kind of thing. So in this one what you do is you substitute uh, wherever a is there you substitute with b uh, and wherever b is there you substitute it with not not b. So now this will become instead of a you have b here and b means not 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 b implies this b is as it is uh, b as uh, one second. So this is that we are trying to do somehow this needs to be converted into this particular kind of thing uh, one second. Uh, so you use as it is only b is same as uh, not not b so this will become this one and a has one second uh, this is a implies b implies a not not uh, a as not not b uh, so now this axiom will become this one, one second. So what you have done here is this thing. Uh, this will become not not b implies not b implies a means not not b. So what you have done here is, is that for a you substituted it not not b and for uh, B you substitute with not B. So now this is what it becomes. So now uh, what we have here is this thing. Uh, I'm sorry here. Uh, just uh, very sorry for this. So. It is uh, a implies uh, b implies a. This is uh, axiom number one, and uh, somehow this uh, should con be converted into this particular kind of format. So now, uh, for a, if you can take uh, as b, and then b as not not b, and then a will become this. So this is a simple kind of uh, translation and all. So I'm just. Uh, so what you have done here for a, you have substituted it. With B, wherever A is there, you substitute with B, and for B, you substituted not not B. This is what happens. So now this is the seventh step. So now observe this uh, two things: this one and this one. So now this is B implies some X, and this X implies not not B. So that means using corollary one, of course this follows here. You can say that. It is B implies not not B. Why it is the case? Because B implies not 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 B implies B, but the same thing not 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 B implies not not B. So then this goes to this particular kind of thing. So that is what we are trying to prove. So in this way we can prove B implies not not B. How did we do this thing? We started with an axiom, and then again we use one important corollary of deduction theorem. Then our proof has become simplified here. So let us consider one or two more proofs and we will end this lecture it is only for our practice we are trying to talk about more number of proofs I mean proofs of theorems. So now this is what is a famous kind of instance of material implication so now this is what we are trying to show. So from not a a implies B follows. So now, how do you prove this thing? First, you list out 
this uh, this is considered to be one hypothesis that you write it like this and then you take A also as a hypothesis then uh, we have uh, so we have an axiom that is A implies B implies A so this is what is called axiom number 1 and if you transform this thing into a certain way if you substitute not B for A this is also considered to be an instance of axiom number 1 this is the fifth step. So now you apply modus ponens on these things you will get these particular kinds of things. Uh, so now another instance of uh, this particular kind of axiom is this thing. so A implies suppose if you substitute not A for A and not B for B in axiom number 1 so you will get not B implies not A this is also an instance of axiom number 1 so ultimately we need to show that B should come as an outcome of this particular kind of thing so this is what is also an instance of axiom number 1 so now uh, 2 and 6 2 and 6 modus ponens what is 2 here not a and not a implies this one this modus ponens you will get this thing 2 and 6 modus ponens you will get this so now uh, 2 and 4 and uh, 3 and what else is the thing here 3 and 5 3 and 5 modus ponens you will get not B plus A. So we listed out uh, the hypothesis in this uh, conditional not A and we also assume that A is the case so now we are trying to show that B follows in this particular kind of thing if that is the case then we can show that not A plus A plus B is the case. So now uh, till now the proof is not yet over uh, so we have generated not being plus A and we have not being plus A not A so now the axiom number 3 is like this not B implies not A is same as not B implies A implies B what is this this is axiom number 3 so now observe this uh, 7 and 9 is 7 and 9 modus ponens again you will get this particular kind of portion not B implies A implies B under the 10th step so now observe uh, 8 and uh, 10 so 8 and 10 again modus ponens 8 and 10 is here not B implies A and not B implies A less B from these two you will get because this is same as this one this gets detached and what you get is this one B so this is not the end of the proof and all so what we essentially show is this thing so I am writing it here so now what is that we got from A and not A what you got here B so now this is what we have showed so now we need to apply deduction theorem twice so that these two things will come on the, at the right hand side so now first time when you apply uh, deduction theorem so this goes to the right hand side so now there is an order which need, you need to follow suppose if you have two formulas A and not A and B first time when you apply modus ponens this goes to the right hand side and this will become not modus ponens deduction theorem it goes to the other hand and then it will become A implies B so now next time when you apply uh, uh, the same deduction theorem it will become not A uh, implies this goes to the right hand side it will become A implies B so like this uh, one can use deduction theorem two or three times and all I can move all the left hand side things to the right hand side so this is the way to prove this famous paradox of material implication this is one of the instances of paradox of material implication so this is the way to show it so now uh, just we will get ourselves familiarized with uh, this uh, deduction theorem 
for example, if you have a set of formulas like uh, A not A and B and that you get C. So, this is what you obtain from let us say this C is obtained from these three things. So, now you keep on applying deduction theorem for the first time when you apply it this goes to this particular kind of thing then it will become A implies C. So, now the next time when you apply this particular kind of thing of course, gamma is already there set of well formed formulas taken together with these things leads to C. Next time when you apply deduction theorem this goes to the other side then it will become not A implies A implies C. So, now if you want to eliminate this also then you need to apply uh, this is second time you applied first time and deduction theorem applied third time leads to this. So, this goes to the right hand side this will become B implies uh, uh, what is that uh, B implies not A implies A implies C. So, whole thing is in brackets. So, like this uh, one can use reduction theorem n number of times then ultimately this this one can show it as a tautology whatever is there on the right hand side suppose if you write it like this there is nothing at the left hand side that means whatever follows after this one is considered to be a theorem. So, that is what we can one can show. So, now let us consider the last kind of theorem which is called as law of contraposition by using the same kind of Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system. So, with this I will end this lecture. So, so what is this law of contraposition that is not B implies not A implies A implies B. So, in each and everything which you are trying to prove what essentially one requires is, is that what kind of axiom one needs to take into consideration. So, that uh, that goes as far as possible closer to this particular kind of thing. So, again we make use of this thing the last axiom A sorry not B implies A implies B this is axiom number 3. So, now we are proving it here with the help of this thing. Now take into consideration some of the hypothesis. So, that is not B implies not A as your hypothesis. So, this is the if suppose if you assume that this is the whole conditional and all. So, now the first part is considered the antecedent and the, this is the consequent. So, now in this antecedent part is assumed. So, that is not B implies A and you also assume this particular kind of thing. So, that is not B implies A this is also considered to be hypothesis or assumption etc. Now, from this you need to prove B. So, uh, so not B implies uh, not A of this particular kind of thing which we assume. So, what essentially we have done here is, is that first we started with uh, this hypothesis that is uh, the antecedent part of your conditional that is considered to be assumption or hypothesis. Now, we have used this particular kind of axiom. So, now uh, uh, this needs to be stated below that, but it does not matter let us say this is the second step in the third step not being plus not a and not being plus not a same thing this by modus ponens 2 and 1 modus ponens you will get not B implies A implies B. Uh, this is still not in this particular kind of format A implies B we need to do a little bit of uh, this thing. Uh, now, we make use of axiom number 1 that is A implies B implies A this is axiom number 1. So, now one instance of this particular kind of axiom is like this A implies for B you substitute with not B and this will become like this. So, now this is instance of axiom number 1. So, now we have A implies not B implies A and not B implies A implies B so that means in the sixth step you will get A implies B. So, how did we get this one? This x implies y and y implies z that means x 
implies z that is a implies b. So now uh, what we have shown here is, is that from assumption not b implies not a you prove a implies b. So now you apply deduction theorem here then this goes to the right hand side and this will become not b implies not a implies a implies b. So this is what is considered to be law of non uh, law of contra position. So in this lecture what we did is simply like this that we presented Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system both in the unrevised format and revised form we have taken into consideration the revised form H prime which consists of the third axiom this one otherwise it is it, it was like this that not B implies not A is nothing but A implies B. So that also you can take it as one of the important axiomatic system. So we presented the axiomatic system which involves only implication and negation signs and then we use transformation rules and modus ponens then we derived some of the theorems and we also made use of one of the important theorems of axiomatic propositional logic so that is the deduction theorem. Deduction theorem in a nutshell tells us that if you have a set of formulas gamma and you have a formula A and from that if you have deduced B then you are also said to have deduced A plus B by using the same set of formulas gamma and there are two important calories that we have discussed in greater detail that is we also showed we also proved these things suppose if A plus B and B plus C as a hypothesis and then from this A plus C will come as an outcome so that is a kind of rule of syllogism and all. So another important property is, is that if A plus B plus C is the case and B is the case then one can even deduce A plus C. We made use of this calories and deduction theorem and then we have simplified the proofs that are there in the, uh, there in the given axiomatic system. So so far we have studied Principia Mathematica uh, the Russell uh, axiomatic system due to Russell Whitehead and another axiomatic system due to Hilbert and Ackerman. So in the next class what we are going to see is, is that are these systems complete that means in a sense that all the provable things that are there in this uh, axiomatic systems are true are valid or all the valid formulas are considered to be true uh, whether or not the system is complete etc. Uh, we, we will establish these uh, things by using by making use of some kind of meta theoretic theorems such as theory of consistency theory of soundness etc. And all. The next class we deal with whether or not Principia Mathematica is complete etc. All these important questions we will be dealing with in the next class.